I'd be the first one to tell you I think it'd be great if every time I opened this word of God, it just constantly affirmed my soul, my mind, my will, and my emotions, and it made me feel comfortable. <laughs> but it doesn't. Does it make you feel comfortable? Okay, so put yourself on the potter's wheel. You're there anyway. You might as well see yourself there. And God is the potter. And life is spinning. And he sees something that isn't good. For us, you know, it's always about God's love first, right? It's always about the fact that he has something greater in vision in mind for these vessels than what we actually have for ourselves. And he knows where the weak spots are. Somebody get this this morning. He knows. And he's not going to let us off that potter's wheel at any part of our journey. Because he's determined to love us, even though sometimes we don't love ourselves. He's determined to keep us on the wheel because he says, oh, I know who I created you to be and do, and you're not there yet. You're not there yet. But you're, you're on the journey. As long as the potter's wheel is spinning, you're on a journey. But here's where life ends up. We get weary of being the focus of God's attention for change, don't we? Are you, are you sometimes weary that God's just spent a lot of time on you and he says, like, I'm taking you and I'm going to restore re, um, these areas that are weak and I'm going to take you on this journey and you go like, don't! I don't want to be on that wheel anymore. I don't want to be there anymore. I want to step back and I want to off this wheel because I am not comfortable with everything that's wrong with me. Uh-oh. That, that, we could pause right there because the bottom line is we are really quick to find what's wrong with everybody else. Oh, Jesus needs to do a work in you, but I'm good, Right? I'm good. I know my heart's right. How many times I've heard that. I know my heart's right. But you still need to be a work of grace. Amen? And you still need to be on the potter's wheel. Amen? And praise God that you allowed him to do what he's done so far, but you're not done. And the book of Revelation calls people, what? To come back to Jesus, the first love. And who's Jesus? He's the Lord. He's the potter, for heaven's sakes. He's the one that says, I have this plan for you, and you invited me into your life, and I need to do what I need to do to bring the necessary restoration to your heart. I need to bring you in one with the Father. And we just get so weary of that process so weary. There are positive aspects to, use myself as an example, there are positive aspects to my life where I have allowed Jesus to do that work. And at the same time, somebody say at the same time, there's these negative aspects that God's working on. It's hard sometimes to look at how far Jesus has brought us when it seems that there's such a long way to go. But God says, don't get weary in that journey. Stay focused. Stay devoted. And Jesus says it this way. Count the cost. Count the cost. I'm going to read from the Gospel of Luke for our New Testament passage. We're gonna, then we'll put them together. You like a sandwich? Luke 14. 24 through 33. I'm going to read from the Living Bible today on this one. <clears throat> Great crowds were following him. He turned around and he addressed them as followers. Anyone who wants to be my follower, Jesus said, must love me far more than he does even his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, or sisters. Yes, more than his very own life. Otherwise, he cannot be my disciple. 
And no one can be my disciple who does not carry his own cross and follow me. Verse 28. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who begins construction of a building without first getting estimates and then checking to see if he's had enough money to pay the bills? Otherwise, he might complete only the foundation before running out of funds. And then how would everyone, and then how everyone would laugh? Verse 30. See that fellow over there? They would mock. He started that building and ran out of money before it was finished. Verse 31. Or what king would ever dream of going to war without first sitting down with his counselors and discussing whether his army of 10,000 is strong enough to defeat the 20,000 men who are marching against him? If the decision is negative, then while the enemy troops are still far away, he will send a truce team to discuss terms of peace so no one can become my disciple unless he first sits down and he costs counts his blessings and then renounces them all for me. The journey uh, with Christ is not for the lightly committed. He's not merely interested in growing the numbers of his followers. He's, his goal is to bring every follower to a loyal and mature faith in God's love. Our allegiance to Christ must be declared and we do that by bringing him our lives. His goal is to bring every follower to a loyal and mature faith. That, that, that mature faith that says, no matter how many times you put me on the potter's wheel, Lord, I'm going to believe you have my very best in mind, and I'm going to cooperate with the process. I'm going to stay in love in the midst of it all. There's Today I just wanted to touch on the terms of discipleship. What do you think of when you think of discipleship? In light of this word today, Jeremiah's prophetic message, he was sent by God to warn Israel that God was with them and was trying to work in their lives and to make them a blessing and partnered with Christ's message that we are to weigh the costs before making a commitment because it by no means is a little thing. People throw the word Christianity around all the time. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. We got our tattoos. We got our Bibles with our name on it. Sounds pretty spiritual. But devotion to Christ is devotion to his message and his mission. And his message is salvation. It's salvation of the personal nature. Isn't it? It's a personal journey. God came in the form of Jesus Christ, and he says, let me show you what I'm really looking for as my family. This is why I want a family, and this is what you're going to look like. And all of a sudden, Jesus lives in this servant lifestyle and complete devotion and obedience to the Father. And he goes, okay, now you've seen it. There's, that's, that one's off the potter's wheel. That one, that's a finished work. That one's, that I started and he's done. And there's your goal. And everybody go like, what? I, I can never be like Jesus. Well, truthfully, in and of your own strength, you're accurate. What is grace for? Bonhoeffer, he said, grace isn't cheap. Grace is extravagant. And grace is what does the work while we're on the potter's wheel, if we allow the process. And Jesus goes so far and he goes, oh, it is so costly for you and I to be on that wheel and to have this process to be sent the recall card. It's so costly that you're going to have to decide what actually has your allegiance in life. And will it be your family 
over me? Will it be your money and your possessions over me? Because just for the record, I'm going to take you so many times on the potter's wheel that eventually you're not going to want any of it but me. Because all things come from me. I'm still going to get those blessings to you. I'm just going to be the first and foremost person in your life and then all the rest of that follows. Remember Jesus says if you just, just follow him, everything else will follow. Whatever your needs are. What are your needs today? See, we get so busy taking care of ourselves. This last week, I had a million things going on. What was your week like? It's a busy week. Storms. Oh, yeah, I got some of that going. That was a little scary, wasn't it? The storms. The flooding. The trauma to so many people that I watched some of the pictures on Facebook and watched the water rising in people's homes. Potter's wheel. Potter's wheel. God's using it to help gain our attention. Don't you think? Maybe you don't believe that. I believe that God does. He loves us so much, and he is constantly trying to get our attention to what his real focus is for our lives. Because we get way off track. I do. I get off track. Sometimes I have to ask myself, Mary, what is your greatest love in life? Who will be the object of your greatest allegiance and affection? And when I ask myself those questions and I'm honest, sometimes I don't like the answer because I've let some things displace my Lord. Amen? It's easy to happen. And God always sends the word to recall, and then God goes, oh, there you are. Come on back. Here we go. Let's get back going on this journey. Let's keep moving forward. Let's make the necessary repairs. Let's, let's just keep going. Don't be discouraged. Let's go. Because in the midst of God's warning is this always this loving, wooing effect that he has. He is never with me, in relationship with me, stopped wooing me in a loving manner toward change. Has he you? And even when stuff goes wrong in my life, I hear him going like, put it into perspective. Come on, just, let's just keep going. Trust me, I'll, I'll work through that. Give that to me. Give that, give that to me. Give that to me. And let's just keep going. This week, I got a recall card card for my car. Yeah, do you know, and I talk about my, my car a lot lately. <laughs> Locks that lock and don't unlock and new batteries and yeah. I thought this was interesting, so I'm going to share it. It says, why haven't you made an appointment? That'll stop and preach right there, won't it? Why haven't you made an appointment with God to go, God, I need a tune-up. I need a check-up. I, I know you're recalling me, God. I need to come. I need to make an appointment to have you really look in my heart. But here's four excuses. I don't have the time for it. I'm, I'm just reading it off the card with a recall. My excuse. I don't have time for it. Even though it's provided at no charge, I got no time for it. Do you know when the first time I got this card? Two years. I'm just being honest. Two years ago, I got the first one of these cards, and they're still sending them to me about quarterly, saying, why haven't you brought your car back for this recall? I don't have the time for it. <laughs> Here's another one of my excuses. I took everything. It's for the ignition. It's, it's regarding the ignition, uh, the key modifier. I already took everything off my key ring. God, I've taken everything off my life I know to take off. I got to be good at this point because there just ain't nothing left. It's got to be good, right? I took everything else off, God. I got everything off my key ring. 
got to be good. I can't be without my car. That's the third one. I can't be without my car, even though they give you a loaner. Right? I can't be without my car. I can't be without those things that I so value, God, that you don't like. I can't see my life without that. Well, okay then. Stay on the potter's wheel. See where that gets you. Because you know what? Jesus never gives up, even though Mary does. Here's another one. I don't even know what to do. I don't know what to do. Hello. For my car and the recall, all I got to do is pick up the phone. And for your life and your potter's wheel experience, for your recall, just pray. Just pray. Just stop long enough to get a clear glimpse of God because he's huge, by the way. He's almighty. There's absolutely nothing that he cannot do in your life or my life. Nothing. But instead, like your pastor and her car, we make excuses. I will confess to you that I have an appointment next Thursday. But I will also confess to you that it didn't come about, that appointment did not come about until Thursday morning when my car flooded. <laughs> I, I had water in my car. Now it seems to be more important for me to get that ignition fixed and the leak. How many times do we just ignore God's prompting only to find ourselves in a much bigger issue. Do you want me to stop there? Do you want me to stop there? With regard to God and his goal for discipleship for us, do we have that picture on here? That, uh, the picture Joe took. There's a discipleship. Do we have that one? No? Oh, okay. Well, forget that. <laughs> it was a boat. It was a boat. It's okay. Huh? But it's okay. No worries. Um, there, are, there are terms that God wants us never to forget, all right? Terms. The first one is he wants to re us to realize that the first goal that he has is to work in ourselves, in the personal nature. That's the first goal. That's why we're on the potter's wheel. That's why Jesus' ministry was so effective as he gave his life to the Lord. He just gave everything to God. And his human, you know, we realize Jesus was fully human and fully divine, right? Right? Okay. So he gave everything in his human side to the work of the divine, didn't he? Jesus wants us to find that place in our personal lives where we are devoted and we give complete allegiance to the work of Christ to make us in his image. Because that's, that's the whole point of the potter's wheel. God wants to make us in the image of Jesus Christ. And, and he loves new beginnings, and he loves growth. And as long as we're growing, even if it's small and short little bursts of growth, he is so thrilled. Do you know that? But what happens is people just stop. They like to stay the blob. They don't really want to be formed and fashioned into a vessel that really honors and glorifies God. So the goal towards self is to become like Jesus through total submission. We need to be willing to follow Christ at the loss of social status, wealth, loss of maybe our time. Maybe we lose careers. Maybe we have to not put loyalty to family, friends as important as 
our relationship with Jesus Christ. It's easy to do. I don't know about you, but I, I love that human hug and that human affirmation, and, and, it, and God always makes sure that I have that. But, you know, in a relationship with God, sometimes we just sit back and go like, God, I just wish, you know, you'd hug me, right? I wish I just knew how much you loved me. And God is always trying to get that to us, but it's of a spiritual nature that permeates from our spirit into our emotions, and we just like that emotional into that spiritual place. It's the opposite, right? God loves us. We got Somebody say, Jesus loves me. There is absolutely nothing he wouldn't do for you. There is no one in the world who will love you the way Jesus does. No one. And he really does want your best. So the goal towards self is to allow him to work in your heart to bring uh, total submission to him. Goal towards others. I see a lot going on in this world with regard to uh, the terms of discipleship when it comes to loving others. Wow, we... This week alone, I just kind of sat back. I shook my head a few times and just went, God, what in the world is going on? Are we loving others? As a country, are we loving others? As individuals, are we loving others? As members of the human race, are we loving others? Maybe you can say yes to all of those. I hope so. But there's a whole world full of people that have no idea how to get beyond themselves a whole world of people. And unfortunately, many of them have microphones. They do. They do. Jesus was all about servanthood. He paid the price so we could be free from self-centered motives. Where's your allegiance to serve others? The other day I watched... uh, the NFL football player Colin Kaepernick, right? Did I say that right? And the fact that he wouldn't stand for the national anthem. And I sat back and I went, wow. I listened. I listened carefully. Some things I could actually go like, well, all right. Hmm. I'm going to try to understand that. I'm going to try to look for Jesus. But he lost me with his socks. Yeah, his little pig with the police hat on. No, he lost me. You know where else he lost me? I don't know what the net worth might be of the athletic, professional athletic community might be, but his net worth alone is about 16 million. And I noticed that he offered a million. Well, that was big of him. He offered a million, but he was divisive in everything that came out of his mouth. It doesn't matter what he does with his money because he was divisive. Okay, so what are you saying, Mary? What if he just said, I'm going to pledge allegiance to this country because this country needs to be formed and fashioned after God Almighty, and then we lift, we are lifted as we give our allegiance to God Almighty, and as a country, we let him put us on the potter's wheel, we can then turn around and really be a blessing to other people. Do you see the difference? Or not? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? The, what's the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, no division, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so if we, every one of us in the United States, were willing to put our lives underneath the excellency of Almighty God on that potter's wheel, do you think we'd have any problem with justice? And do you think we'd have any problem with liberty? Would we have any problem with love? But instead, he drew attention to something that was really quite divisive. I would have really respected him if he goes, you know what? God has blessed me. 
Everything I own belongs to my heavenly Father. Everything that happens in my life, I believe, and I trust him that he's bringing good, not only to my life, but everybody else. I am so blessed. I can't wait to bless other people. I'm going to be an example of what it means to bless other people. I'm not going to point fingers at anything. I'm just going to be an example of what I believe that God wants from me. I want to be an example of generosity. I want to be an example of mercy. I want to be an example of justice. I want to be an example of somebody who understands that the laws were given for my benefit. I want to be that. I struggled with this whole thing this week. I did. I did. Here's another one. In Hollywood, 24 of the most wealthy people, their net worth is $10 billion, according to some stats. Where are they? They're living opulent lifestyles, aren't they? They're saying, you need to do this and that for these people. They don't have any idea that God helped them to get well so that they could spread it out, right? How much money? Do you need that much money? And what are you going to do with it? Discipleship is about taking responsibility for others, too. You know that? But it's the same people all the time that takes responsibility for others. There is this whole spectrum in our country that has no idea what it means to live underneath the lordship of Jesus Christ. And they're selfish. And they're real quick to point fingers, by the way. And I'm going to leave it there. I have problems with that. In your life, let God make you generous with the people around you. It's his money anyway. It's, it's, we live for him and to further his gospel of grace. The fact that Jesus wants to change every human being. Every human being. There, there is no we, they. We all need to be on the potter's wheel. Somebody say amen. Thank you. Otherwise, what's the cross for? We're going to come to the table today. What's the cross for? If it's not to lay our lives down, what's it for? Jesus, he laid down his life. He goes, you know, I'm going to give you everything I have. I'm going to give you everything. The riches of heaven I'm going to make available to you. If you're just willing to be my disciple. But count the cost. My cost was I'm going to die. And you're going to live. Your cost is you're going to blaze a trail in a world that hates servant attitudes, servant living. Your cross is you're going to have to live in a world that really prefers to be selfish and see everything as their own. You're going to face hatred, criticism, condemnation, and it's all anarchy. It's all anarchy. Because everything belongs to the Father. Everything belongs to the Father. Jesus said, if you'll just be my disciples and you'll let me do a work in you, I can show you amazing things and I will take you places where you can be things to other people and you can, you can change history. You can be history changers and life changers. Because he changes my life all the time. Does he change your life? It's a recall. Somebody say it's a recall. I am calling you to think about your life differently because what I see in this world is if somebody isn't starting to say that, we're just going to go be following, thinking everything is just good, and it's not just good. Jesus is coming back. He is coming back, and he says, I love you, beloved. 
Take what I offer you. Let me mold you and shape you and make you into the vessel that is really glorious for the Father. So you'll be ready. So you'll be ready. But yeah, you're ready. You've got to make the call and you've got to get beyond yourself. Your allegiance has to be to Jesus. Amen? Your allegiance has to be fixed. Don't let the world move you. And then allow that grace just to pour into you and to recreate you, to help you see differently. Operate in the lives of your loved ones differently. See, you know, like if we actually have that love of God operating us, we're not going to be just sitting there going like, oh, it's okay, it's all right. You can stay right where you are. You can stay there. We're going to be like, come on, let's be that image of Jesus. Let's let him do the work in us. We'd be like that in our families. We'd be like that in our churches. We'd be like that in our country. Amen? And by the way, it begins with you. It's an inside job. So just start influencing your sphere of influence. The people in your life, just let them know God wants to move in our hearts and in our lives to get us ready, to get us ready for his coming. Amen? Let's, let's get ready. Three calls.